welcome to Spooky Hours with Saunderson. Today we're uh, commemorating the life of Vincent Price, who died uh, this month, 30 years ago, on the 25th of October, 1993. Now, I've asked uh, Peter Fuller, who many of you will know is uh, one of the world leading experts on Vincent Price, his horror films on actually everything that is to do with Vincent Price. He, uh, as I see, he, he runs uh, Vincent Price Legacy UK and does lots of tours and writes books and does all these things to keep uh, Vincent's uh, memory alive. So I've asked him to come along and uh, tell us about uh, the films that uh, Vincent made uh, in the UK uh, from about 1964. I mean, there's so many films we could be talking about, but I really thought it's interesting that uh, a lot of people might think that Vincent Price, uh, for, the, for all the time he spent here uh, in the UK, was British, but he was actually American, but he he referred himself as an Anglophile, and uh, we love him here at the Spooky Isles. So we were going to call it the 13 films of uh, Vincent Price, I'm sure there's more. Doesn't really matter. We're going to have a great time here with Peter talking about Vincent Price and some really cool films. So, as we say, uh, Vincent Price with uh, Peter Fuller. Hello, Peter. How are you today? I'm very well, thank you, David. Thanks for I having just... me. Thank you for being with us. Now, as I said, it's uh, 30 years since Vincent Price uh, passed away. And I was thinking this morning when coming on to do this interview with you, uh, I don't really remember it. I don't, I obviously would have, it would have affected me at the time being a, a lifelong horror fan. But what was it like for you when you you heard the, the very sad news that uh, Vincent had passed back well, in I was. Uh, I, rem I remember it distinctly, actually. Um, I had people call me and sort of say, have you heard the news? um because uh it happened like obviously in america i was here in london and so i had friends of mine in australia ringing me sort of saying did you hear that vincent price has passed away and i went oh dear i'm okay well that's very sad but you know he had good innings and he was he was, bit, he was very ill at the time um so it was a it was a you know it, it was a foregone conclusion that uh, it was just a matter of time of when he would pass away but uh, it was very sad a sad day um but uh, yeah i I thought it was, yeah, it was sad, but... Um, yeah. Yeah. It is, and he was an old man, so that's something that we must say, that, you know, he, and he's left all these wonderful films for us to discuss. And as I said before, he, he did describe himself as an Anglophile. We use a lot of Vincent Price on the Spooky Isles because he is so loved by us, and we want to do all these things. But there, are, there is only a selection that he made in the UK, and I think, from if, if my memory serves me, about 1964 is when he first made a horror film or something like that we would be interested here in spooky owls is that correct that's correct it's correct so it, that was mask of the red death um he shot that in november of 1963 here in london um that was the you know it was like it was part of the um the what they call the the poe corman films that had started in 1960 with house of usher and roger corman and american international pictures put together this great film which was an adaption adaptation of an edgar Allan poe uh, his famous short story and of course that did really really well at the box office and it ended up after pit and the pendulum which came out this, the following year they realized that this there's a market here so they you know it became um every year you would go to see a vincent price film in an in an edgar Allan poe adaptation and the mask of the red death was the seventh film in that cycle and at this stage is that Roger Corman hit on the idea that if he went to London, he could actually uh, have more time to film because they made use of this particular tax incentive called the Eddie Levy. And so that's where Vincent found himself in London, but not for the first time, because, as you said rightly, is that Vincent was an Anglophile, but he had actually started his career here in London um, when he came over here in 1934 to do his master's degree at the Courtauld Institute. Uh, he was uh, stayed here for about a year. And during that time, he caught the acting bug and he found himself uh, working at the Gate Theatre or being employed by the Gate Theatre, which was like an independent theatre um, in Villiers Street near the embankment. And um, uh, that's where he actually performed for the first time on stage, first as a a gum chewing um, detective in the musical Chicago. And then he got the role, which was his calling card to his profession, his new profession as a as an actor. And that was as Prince Albert in Victoria Regina. Uh, he performed it here uh, in May of 34. 
and attracted the interests of Broadway are particularly Helen Hayes. And she actually came all the way to London in September of 34 to actually meet Vincent because they were going to um, re reprise the, uh, the production in, on Broadway in, in New York. And of course, so Vincent left London then, went to New York, and when he did uh, uh, performed in um, Victor, uh, uh, Victor, 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 oh God, Victor Regina, uh, Victor Regina, um, then he became the toast of the town, and of course that was it. He became an actor, and twenty five years later, he's back here in London for Mask of the Red Death, which is actually the best of the Poe cycle. Do you know where, where, did, they, uh, where did they make it here in London? Uh, they filmed it here at, uh, where was it? It was, uh, I think it was Shepparton Studios. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was, uh, he was here um, uh, for about, uh, for a month or two. And, uh, uh, of course, famously, the story, you know, of, uh, is based on Edgar Allan Poe's Mask of the Red Death, but it's really a completely new treatment. Um, which was like about um, you know Prince Prospero, a satanic worshipper, and uh, he gathers his his um, uh, his best friends into his castle as the the Red Death sweeps across the Italian countryside. Um, but of course, he actually also uh, kidnaps a young um, virginal Christian girl, which is Jane Asher, and her dad and her lover, and um, uh, has lots of um, uh, games and horrors that await in the castle as the Red Death uh, makes its presence felt. And of course, then uh, Prince Prospero realises that in fact, death has no master, and ends up succumbing to the Red Death himself, but not before lovely old Jane Asher and the dad and everyone have, have escaped um, from the castle. I didn't know that was, I didn't know that was, a, you know, filmed here. So that's something that new I've learned today. Mm. So what was the next one? We've got a lot of films here to go. So, uh, yeah, well, I mean, the next absolutely, one? absolutely. Well, so, uh, he, the following, uh, the following year in, um, Vincent came back to London. Well, actually not London, but because he actually, he did Tomb of Ligeia, uh, again, Roger Corman. And this was Roger Corman's last Poe film, because at that point in his career, he'd realized that he'd, done its course doing those Poe adaptations and he wanted to take on something new and that's when he started going into the whole countercultural movement and and doing sort of like you know biker films and other exploitation films which were the next big thing but for Tomb of Ligeia, again he relied on a um an idea from uh, Poe's poem and it's quite faithful this one I really enjoyed it and in fact uh Tomb of Ligeia is both Vincent and Roger's favorite uh, of the Poe films. And also it, it gave Roger Corman the best uh, reviews of his career for his entire career as a director. Um, and because it's just so eloquently shot, it's all out in the countryside. And because it's actually shot out at Castle Acre Priory in um, Norfolk, um, um, which is a beautiful location. And uh, today you can visit it. And you can actually visit exactly the same arid spots where the film was were, was shot, and nothing's changed. It's beautiful. It's a very pretty site. I've not been able to get there. I've always attempted to try to get up there at some stage, but for some reason, I've not. But I've seen your photos there, and yeah, again, it just looks like it doesn't look any different, does it? Yes, it's, it, it it looks it looks beautiful. That's the same. And of course, Vincent was a bit old at this point to play. He was playing this Byronic sort of uh, romantic lead. Uh, who was supposed to be having, you know, falls in love with this beautiful red-headed woman, um, the the um, uh, who was Rowena, who's um, Elizabeth Elizabeth Shepherd plays plays the dual part of Ligeia, who's dead and buried, but her her spirit still possesses poor old uh, Vincent Price's Verdon Fell, and uh, it's a battle of wills basically between you know Elizabeth Shepherd's uh, Rowena and Elizabeth Shepherd's like uh, witchy sort of beyond the grave spirit and uh, it's a great film uh, beautifully shot and there's some couple of sequences which people actually feel was uh, what was inspired Alfred Hitchcock when he was doing Vertigo especially a scene involving a um, a bell um, so it's, it's a beautiful film to watch and uh, great again on location which really benefits uh, uh, this particular film and sets it apart from the other Poe films, which were majoritarily uh, done in a studio. Yeah. Number three, what's the next one? 
Number three, unfortunately, it's the soggy bottom underwater affair, which was City Under the Sea, uh, which was released in the US as War Gods of the Deep. Uh, this was like a, a Jules Verne inspired fantasy and where Vincent plays a captain of a group of smugglers who are have been uh, trapped inside an underground city for about 100 years because the gases of the city actually makes them um, live longer lives. But he falls in, he, again, a little bit of Poe here, although it's got nothing to do with Poe, um, except for he, he recites a little um, segment from uh, City Under the Sea, which is actually a, a Edgar Allan Poe poem um, at the beginning of the film um, and at the end. And uh, basically, he sees a picture of this woman, Susan Hart, and it looks like his long lost deceased love. So he kidnaps her and takes her underground. And of course, then two intrepid um, people, uh, Tab Hunter and uh, David Tomlinson from um, Mary Poppins, they go down to try and rescue her. And that's the uh, that's the, the film. And John Lee Maggiore is there as a, as a priest. And um, there's a chicken, uh, Herbert the Chicken, which pops Do you up like this film? You don't, I don't think you sound like you like this film much. Do you know, as a kid, I really enjoyed it. But I always had an issue with the fact that there's a 10 minute um, uh, chase scene, or escape scene at the end, and it just goes on forever and ever. But the music by Stanley Black is really good. Um, I like it in parts. I mean, it could have been a lot better. They've, they've got these great gill men, which are these creatures, which are the inhabitants of the, uh, of the, the underwater city. And uh, much more could have been made of them because they weren't scary. They were actually just real cool looking. Uh, the Gill Men, they were great. Um, but yeah, it was, um, it was one, this, this film was the brainchild of American International's uh, new head of European productions, uh, Louis D. Kaywood. And he was the one who actually like, you know, wrote the script basically and introduced the chicken. And um, he was also, so he would be responsible for all of Vincent's British made AIP films until he ended up departing from the company in 72. So, um, uh, good or bad, uh, he, he's the one who actually is responsible for uh, for Vincent's output. Okay. Number four. Number four. Let's have a look at number four. Uh, oh, of course. It's the highlight, isn't it? Um, so, Vincent was back again in 67 uh, to film Witchfinder General. Now, this is the film, of course, where... Vincent famously plays uh, the self-appointed witchfinder, Ipswich lawyer Matthew Hopkins, real-life person uh, who killed, you know, who actually caused the death of over 300 uh, men, women and children uh, during his very short uh, reign, uh, where he was actually just going from town to town and for a bag of silver, uh, he would actually get them to confess, uh, people to confess that they were consorting with the devil. And of course, a great character for Vincent's play. Um, originally, um, this film was um, supposedly uh, directed by uh, Michael Reeves. He'd been brought in by uh, a co-production of um, both American International Pictures and um, Tony Tenser's Tiger Pictures. And uh, so that put it together. And of course, Vincent was part of the package. Um, Michael Reeves would have preferred to have Donald Pleasance in the role, um, but Vincent is absolutely brilliant. Thankfully, it's because of Michael Reeves' inability to actually direct <laughs> a veteran actor like Vincent. They came to blows um, during the, the, the filming of it. Um, and often, you know, like Vincent was very, very upset. He was very, he was not happy on this shoot. Um, but, you know, what Michael Reeves achieves is a fantastic um basically British revenge Western, you know, set in the East Anglia countryside. And again, beautifully shot on location, Lavin and Swatham and around that area. And uh, it really benefits from the cameras getting out, uh, out and about. Of course, Vincent, he much preferred to the comforts of the studio. So he wasn't particularly um, happy about having to uh, be out outdoors, especially riding a horse, which he didn't like. He hated horses. Um, and he was a, had a fear of snakes as well. But uh, again, despite um, the difficulties, Michael Reeves was able to like um, get a performance from Vincent, which has now gone down in history as being his most serious um, horror role. 
and he's brilliant at it. He's very, very creepy. Actually, I think for, for me, this is the role where he actually is purely sinister. How much do you think comes down to Michael Reeves' lack of direction or more direction? What do you think he gave to that? I think what he did is he stopped Vincent from like, you know, there was there's this great, there's a great story where when they were filming the witch burning sequences at uh, in Lavenham in the little town uh, square, market square there, uh, Vincent was just gestic gesticulating a little bit too much. And uh, Michael Reeves said, stop doing that. And he just turned around and said, he said, how dare you say that to me? I've made 70 films. How many have you made? And he said, two good ones. And I think he, he did he had he, Michael Reeves was one of those people who he didn't know how to direct actors um but in doing so in taking Vincent to task is he did actually get a great um um performance from him and then later um uh, can I read this to you because yeah, this is actually thing. later uh, Vincent um wrote an apologetic letter to Michael Reeves. And this is what he wrote. He said, my dear Michael, in spite of the fact that we didn't get along too well, mostly my fault as I was physically and mentally indisposed at that particular moment in my life, I do think you have made a very fine picture. And what's more, I liked what you gave me to do. And I think that sums it up, that Vincent's you know, really, really enjoyed, well, enjoyed seeing that role after it had been edited and, and released. And, so it sounds like he was grumpy, but afterwards he was appreciative of yeah, yeah. the film. So it worked, it worked out all right for him. Which I think he needed because, you know, Vincent was a kind of actor who could make the unbelievable believable. Um, but, of course, it depended on the director. The director would, most directors actually just let him go. Him and Roger Corman had a very, very good working relationship and he knew exactly um, Roger Corman knew exactly what he wanted from Vincent, so he didn't actually have to direct him too much, uh, because they would talk about the character, whether it was like you know Roger Gusher or Prince Prosper or one of those, and Vince and let Vincent actually find his own um, a performance in 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 the, usually in the script because it, the script was very well written, especially the yeah. earlier scripts in the, the earlier Poe films. Uh, however, um, you know this. Now that Vincent was back in London doing what we call the post cycle two, is AIP realised after Roger Corman had left that they still could make money out of making films about Ledger Gill and Poe with Vincent Price as the number one marquee name. So that's why they did City Under the Sea, um, which, which has nothing to do with Poe, really. I mean, it's Jules Verne. Um, and then came uh, Witchfinder General. OK, brilliant. Um, however, in the America, they called it the Conqueror Worm because they wanted to attach it to Poe again. Again, it has nothing to do with Poe. And then we have the next one, which is the Oblong Box. Again, mm. absolutely nothing to do with Poe except for the name, the Oblong Box. Very um, cool, though. I like that a lot. And I believe we we actually did a whole whole feature on that one. We did. We'll link to that because I like that film a lot. I was not, not saying I was quite surprised by it, but I was pleasantly surprised when I watched it because I thought it was brilliant. So I, I liked it a lot. Yeah, so, so that, about was, that film. That film is like you know mixes like a voodoo with a family secret curse, and there's a bit of a slasher in there, and it's all it's it's a it's a convoluted plot. Um, but again, um, uh, this was the first film which teamed up Gordon Hessler from Golden Forge of Sinbad and TV uh, TV uh, Hitchcock Presents and um, Christopher Wicken. And the two of them, and then John Keoken, who's the cinematographer, and the three of them made the oblong box for AIP. And, you know, originally it was Michael Reeves that was actually due to be, uh, to direct the film. However, he pulled out of it um, through health reasons. And also he looked at the script and thought, hmm, I don't think this is the kind of thing I want to do. Um, it doesn't really gel because originally it was going to be shot in Ireland and it was all going to be about um, Irish spirits and all sorts of things like that but it completely changed um, because they ended up shooting it here uh, in London at um, uh, at uh, Shepparton I think it was uh, yeah Shepparton Studios and uh, it ended up being a film about I don't know colonial imperial exploitation of African slaves which is very weird. Um, so much so that actually the film got banned in Texas because they felt it was too pro-black. Um, so in this one, of course, Vincent plays a, uh, a lord who's been uh, hiding his brother who's disfigured 
in a room for ages. And of course, when his brother actually escapes, he goes out to seek his revenge. And uh, there's all very convoluted. Christopher Lee pops up as, a, as an autonomous who is blackmailed by um, Sir, Edmund, uh, Sir Edward uh, into uh, sheltering him while, when he escapes. Uh, but he didn't last very long. In fact, him and Vincent, this is the first film there, both Vincent Price and Christopher Lee appear in together. And they only have a, a couple of seconds <laughs> together because um, Vincent just comes in at one point when after Christopher Lee's character has had his throat slit uh, to actually like um, say, who did this to you? Uh, and uh, yeah, but otherwise it's, yeah, it's, it's one of those films that, you know, I think Vincent actually said, uh, despite the script, despite everything, he felt that both Hessler and Wicking had done a, a tremendous job on, on the film. And it, it did uh, do well at the box office. I like it a lot. I think this is one of my, I mean, obviously, which find a general, but I like this a lot, this one. Okay, number six. Yeah, well, uh, Vincent and, and Christopher got to reunited for one of my favourites, um, the... <laughs> the conspiracy sci-fi horror thriller scream and scream again um there so you know they again the same team hessler wicking and and kokion um and aip went did a co-production with uh, this time around uh it was with um uh, with amicus um so um with milton uh, with um amicus productions so um uh, that was quite interesting um milton Sabosky was uh, was uh, had originally come up with a script they didn't like it and Christopher Wicking, like, thankfully, went back to the source novel, which is called The Disorientated Man. It's a great novel uh, written by um, various people under the name of Peter Saxon, uh, but it dealt with this alien conspiracy uh, about um, people being created, a, being a, cre a, a race of super beings being cre created out of composites. And it has various storylines, Eastern Europe, London, and there's like a vampire killer on the loose and then there's somebody having their legs and arms amputated in a mysterious hospital um and yeah it's 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 a really weird film but i loved it because not because of vincent price it's actually because of alfred marx who plays the um police uh a detective investigating these so-called vampire murders which are committed by this hip guy called keith michael gothard um he's going around actually uh, gorging on lovely nubile miniskirt lovelies and in, in a nightclub in uh, called the busted pot it's very hip and then there's this great uh chase sequence which goes on for quite a while very 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 good and it's um again it was because both wicking and hessler were aiming for a, a conspiracy theory aka you know like an american style thriller mm. that's what they were trying to achieve as well as well as the uh, the sides the sci-fi i really enjoyed it um unfortunately the ip that they wanted to market it as a uh, triple distilled horror featuring vincent price critically and peter cushing so what they did is the last minute they thought oh that's a great idea we can actually team up all three of them but uh, barely do they each three of them have much screen time i think vincent has the most he appears in the beginning and somewhere in the middle and then just at the climax whereas christopher lee he pops up again a couple of times here and there but him and vincent only have one scene that lasts a matter of seconds uh while peter cushing does a brilliant three minute cameo uh where basically he is a major benedict and he's behind the in this fascist uh, totalitarian totalitarian um uh country and marshall jones who plays Conrad's? He's the uh, the composite who's going out to just close down Browning's operation because these composites have gone uh, gone rogue. And uh, poor old mate, uh, Peter Cushing gets uh, the what we call the Vulcan death grip or the Vulcan um, uh, pinch nerve, nerve pinch. You know, that, you know that? Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, his death, the look on his face when he's dying is fantastic. You should have got a Academy Award for that one. Yeah. So yeah, so Scream and Scream again actually ended up becoming one of AIP's biggest hits, um, and so therefore, you know, again, you know, a co-production um, with Amicus was was a, was a good idea for Amicus because it gave them a, a good uh, run for their money as well. 
I think I'm going to have to watch it again because I think I said to you when I watched it at the time, I thought of it as snooze and snooze again. I didn't like the big scene and all that, which was, was when you said a city under the sea had it's a 10 minute se- you know, chase scene or something like that. And I'm thinking, well, we're about to get up to the scream and scream again, which is the bit I hated about it. But anyway, maybe I need to watch it again with a, you know, maybe I was a bit grumpy at the time. I don't know. So, uh, <laughs> well, Vincent, Vincent always, I love Vincent's little comment when he said, I said, scream and scream again. I have no idea what it's about and I don't know which scream I was. <laughs> Yeah, no, anyway, so it's all part of the interesting colour of his career. What's number seven? What's lucky seven? Okay, so, you know, we, again, it's like, you know, it's a bit of a mixed bag, actually, because the next one is actually another, I quite like it, but boy, does it have a problem. Cry the Banshee. Mm. Again, this is, um, again, uh, it's Hessler and Wicking and Kokian uh, teaming up again. And this one is uh, has Vincent playing a Elizabethan magistrate who ends up, um, getting cursed by a high priestess, a pagan high priestess uh, called Una, uh, who actually summons up a demon to take down his family one by one. Now, sounds like a great idea. And uh, it was heavily promoted with lots of sex and violence, but of course, none of that actually really happens in the film. Um, and basically, Vincent actually sort of spends most of the time eyebrow, you know, going eye rolling. And. <laughs> goes back to his high camp uh, theatrics in this one. But of course, Hessler said, actually, it was good that he did that because it elevated the rest of the film sort of thing. So, But there's some couple of really good um, uh, bits and pieces in this film I quite like. Hilary Dwyer, she's um, playing his daughter. And Hilary had also already been in Witchfinder General, where she plays uh, the, the person he's trying to lust after. And then she was in the oblong box as his fiance slash wife. And now he's, she's playing his daughter. So she has a, you know, she was his most consistent female co-star in this, in these seventies uh, um, uh, AIP films. Uh, Patrick Moa pops up as um, a mysterious young man who may or may not have some links with Una played by Elizabeth Bergner. She was a 1930s stage actress, German stage actress. And this was her sort of comeback. Um, and there's a great other actress in there called Essie Person, and she plays Vincent's uh, wife, who's going slowly, slowly mad, and she has a fantastic um, uh, breakdown at a banquet sequence, which I absolutely love. Mm. Um, and unfortunately, um, uh, the mask that they use for the Banshee, or the Sith, uh, is really crap, and you only <laughs> ever see it at the end, but I won't spoil it, because if you haven't seen the film, that's... Uh, um it, an interesting uh, thing to laugh at uh, and of course when it was edited uh, when it was finished as uh, there are actually two cuts to this film uh in the uk gordon hessler's um uh edit is as he directed it and it also has uh, a score by wilfred owens and it benefits by the fact that like the opening credits are done by terry gilliam um however when it went to America, when, uh, the American um, cut, because you can remember is it because it's a co-production, uh, they have different territories. Um, they, uh, they completely um, re-edited the film, changed sequences around, um, and used their in-house composer, Les Baxter, who's one of my favorites, and his score is actually my more preferred one out of the two, uh, but it doesn't match if you added it with the Terry Gilliam uh, credits. It doesn't doesn't work. Um, but the and then also what do they also do? Yes, they yeah they re-edited it and added Terry Gilliam uh, a new score and got rid of Terry Gilliam's um, credits. So um, but it's um, that's the the version that I've always seen um, on VHS. That was the way it was released in Australia. But only now can you actually see the um, uh, the UK edit, uh, which is. It, readily available on um blu-rays so what's the so the one i've seen is the terry gilliam one yes so what's the american version like well, i mean you just told me what it's like but yeah well, what the deal what, is, what's is that the difference american, the american version brings the uh the uh when vincent's character uh, edmund whitman actually attacks and kills the um the witches the coven breaks up the coven it's actually po- posted as the very very beginning of the film um, whereas in the UK version, which is Kessler's version, it's later. Sort of thing. Okay. So, yeah. so then how do you think that affects the uh, narrative of it? I did actually a very long article once <laughs> for The Long Dead, uh, looking, exploring the two cuts and seeing the, the, the pros and cons of them. Uh, I think 
it works. Um, I think the UK one works better. It's just that my memory was always the US one. And um, I, it made sense that Una would actually sort of like straight away set her revenge right at the beginning of the film, as opposed to in the UK version, it's actually, we see more of, um, uh, it's a, there's a prologue more sort of thing. So, yeah. Yeah, I think I saw it first here, so I wouldn't have seen the Australian version. So, but maybe I, I think probably actually I did. I'm, I'm sure I saw it back in Australia. So, what's number eight? Well, number eight is um, the wonderful, the abominable Dr. Fibes. Um, so, Vincent was back here uh, to film that in um, 1970. And uh, it's, let's face it, uh, it's, it's iconic because this was the film that actually. It inducted Vincent Price into the pantheon of classic horror characters um, because he plays, you know, Dr. Anton Fibes, a classicist and organist who's maimed in a car crash while racing to uh, to his wife, who's actually like being operated on by 10 uh, London doctors. And unfortunately, he has a car crash and burns alive. And, you know, that's it. They think he's dead. But of course, he comes back to seek his revenge using the like 10 plagues of Egypt uh, on the doctors who um, failed to save his beloved Victoria on the operating table. And she's played by an uncredited uh, Caroline Munro. Uh, it's beautiful. I mean, Robert Fust, who was fresh off the Avengers, um, and Brian Clements, who helped uh, write the, uh, the, the, the great ending of this film, um, got together with, with a great team. And it's a beautiful homage to, you know, a 1930s Art Deco, Art Nouveau production design. It's just a beautiful, beautifully shot. Um, and it's got a great score by Basil Kirshen, quite quirky, quite uh, quite uh, bizarre. Um, Fuse didn't really like the music, but uh, I think it works splendidly. It's got a great cast and, of course, reunited uh, Vincent with Joseph Cotton, who plays his adversary in this, Dr. Vesalius. Uh, uh, Vincent and Joseph had actually worked together um, right at the beginning of their careers, their acting careers, when they were both working at the um, Orson Welles Mercury Theatre in the late 1930s. So they've known each other for years, for many, many years. They were good pals. And so it was great to have Joseph Cotton in that role, which was originally intended for Peter Cushing. Um, however, his wife, Helen, was very ill at that point. Um, so, uh, you know, she only had a couple of months to live at that point. So he, he denied, um, uh, he opted out having that role, but uh, would have been interesting to see. But uh, uh, Joseph Cotton's great in it. Mm. Um, and it's got a fantastic uh, cast and crew of British greats. And it's just a, a film that I can watch over and over and over again. So It's a wonderful film. Yeah. Number, number nine. Number nine. I must say that at this point, 1971, Vincent was also doing a couple of interesting side projects, one of which was his um, six-episode series, Cooking Pricewise. Uh, so he actually filmed that whilst he was here in London doing Dr. Fibes, the first film. Mm -hmm. And he um, also he had to film that up in Pebble Mill in Birmingham. But he also was the subject of a London weekend television um, special, musical special called Vincent Price's In the Country, which um, I've only ever seen uh, at a rare screening last year at the BFI, and it's a hoot. Um, and uh, one day, I hope uh, it gets a release, by which, of course, was where Vincent was trying to educate London housewives into the, how to make world zine cheap and easy in their kitchens. Okay. What, what was place. the sorry? What was the one about in the country? What's what is that about? Okay, so that literally it's a musical special. So it's Vincent going to a country house, um, and he has some guests. Pat Patricia Routledge is one of the guests, and he hosts hosts a dinner party. And basically, there's music. Um, there's like sort of bits of music here and there, and it's just. And then he has like a little dinner party, and he talks to people. Ned Sharon's one of the other um, uh, uh, guests. It's it's a it was a peculiar idea, but it was very interesting, and uh, it's it's a great novelty thing to 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 seek out. Um, but unfortunately, only only you can only see it at the BFI. Uh, if you go to the BFI, you can go to the Media Tech, and you can actually select it in the Media Tech, and you can watch it for free. Okay, well that's be interesting. We'll have to do that. Mm. Okay, so we're just saying number nine. Well, number nine is of course uh, because of the success of Doctor Vibes, 
is that literally Vincent was back in December of 71 to film the sequel, Dr. Fives Rises Again, uh, which was same team, uh, Robert Fust. This time he had the idea of um, paying homage to the serials of the 1930s. So it has that look. And again, it's very, very uh, based on, uh, at that time, there was a huge um, love for Egyptology because at that, that time it was the Tutankhamun Museum, uh, Tutankhamun exhibition was traveling around. Mm -hmm. And so people were really into, you know, uh, Egyptology. And so therefore he based it around that where this time Dr. Fibes um, and his and uh, and and uh, his Victoria and his new Volnavia, who's his assistant, mute assistant, this time played by the lovely Valley Kemp, Australian model, and uh, they head out to uh, Egypt, where they try to seek out the River of Life. Um, but of course, at the same time, is that there's another Egyptologist called Dr. Bidebeck, and he's got an expedition out there too, looking for the River of Life because. He's been relying on it to keep himself alive. And that was played by Robert Quarry, who had done huge, huge business for AIP with the uh, Count Yorga films. And so he was lined up as being basically the new Vincent Price. Um, so, um, and that didn't go down well because there's a famous story that um, uh, Vincent and Robert Quarry didn't get on uh, during the filming of Dr. Vibes Rises again. But of course, that has all been blown out of proportion because. They were two very larger than life characters and they liked sort of like, um, you know, playing tricks on each other. And uh, Vincent wasn't, uh, um, he was, he, he liked to swear. And so therefore, you know, he, people actually thought, oh God, he's swearing at Robert Quarry. But, you know, they were just having a laugh. <laughs> All right, well, that sounds cool. So at number 10. Number 10. Now, if I was to choose, um you know because i hate lists and uh if i have to choose a vincent price film which would be on the top of my list or my top five this is the one uh vincent basically was coming to the end of his uh um contract with aip uh it was he had he was terminated or well, finished in 73 but he was committed to one more film but before that um he was able he was offered a script uh by his agent and um it was called much ado about murder and it was a film about a shakespearean actor who seeks his revenge against the critics who dare lambast his previous season of shakespeare and of course this is what became theater of blood um it's my favorite because this was vincent doing something that he always wanted to do and that was to perform shakespeare uh, on the screen on the big screen he would ever played shakespeare uh, as richard the third back in 1953 which was the year that house of wax came out and that was the film that actually really helped launch him as a horror actor horror icon uh, and so theater of blood comes out in 73. so i actually think house of wax and theater of blood are they sort of bookend vincent's horror career and what a film to actually sort of say yes this is this is a great film because he gets to play not only seven shakespeare characters but also a, quite a number of incidental characters as well and they're all very very funny um but at the same time he was he's able to like bring in a poignancy um to his character that you really feel for like you know edward lionheart his name is his Shakespearean tragedian. He's been around since the 1940s, but by the 1970s, people are actually thinking, oh God, you know, the way you do Shakespeare is a bit old hat, a bit old fashioned. And so the critics of the day uh, don't really like his performance. Um, very much so is, is that when they were creating the role of the character of Edward Leinhardt, they had Donald Wolfert as the idea of who they were thinking of. And if you've ever seen Donald Wolfert in, in any of his, his films, he is actually just naturally camp and a uh, bit of a ham and so vincent uh, loved doing this role because also it allowed him to have a subtle sort of like um attack against his own critics because he knew that um you know he knew that people thought of him as a bit of a ham actor so uh, it was a beautiful film and of course diana rigg is is among is it plays his daughter 
uh, who's actually helping him in his revenge plot. But then the best thing is, is the supporting cast. And that was the other reason why Vincent did it is because it actually attracted the the creme de la creme of British theatrical um, industry of the day. So, you know, you had people like Robert Morley, Dennis Price, uh, Jack Hawkins, uh, Robert Coote. Um, who else is there? Oh, oh uh, Milo O'Shea, Irish, and uh, Ian Hendry as his adversary. It's just a brilliant film. And of course, the lovely Madeline Smith is also in there, um, uh, playing Rosemary, the secretary to um, Ian Hendry's character, Peregrine Devlin. But yes, it's a, a great film, all shot on location in London. And that's the other great thing about this film, because it's directed by Douglas Hickox, who is quite known for doing sort of action-y type films. And uh, his cameraman, Walter Shlitskinski, uh, really go to town on making London look like one of the stars because they shot it like at the Kensal Green Cemetery and at, uh, at uh, on Vauxhall and in um, Putney. And uh, it really benefits from that. So, um, of course, as you know, is, is that we do, I do walking tours of those uh, locations now. And I joined you and I was one helping you photograph some of those places when we originally found where they were. Yes, exactly. Many years so, ago. So, yes, uh, yeah, Vincent's uh, Theatre of Blood is basically uh, one of the creme de la creme of all of his British. And he met, someone, he met someone when he was doing that tour, did yeah, he? Uh, that film. Yeah, I was just about to, uh, to mention that. Is, is that at the time, of course, one of the other uh, supporting cast members was Coral Brown, uh, Melbourne-born uh, uh, actress. But she'd been living in London since the 1940s, uh, uh, working on stage and screen. And uh, she um, and Vincent really hit it off uh, when they met. And unbeknownst to poor old Dinah Rigg, who introduced them at a charity event, um, they started seeing each other, despite the fact that Vincent was supposedly happily married. Um, he, him and his wife, Mary, had been married for like 28 years. And he had at the time a 10 year old daughter, uh, which is Victoria. And uh, lo and behold, is as it was, they were filming Theatre of Blood, him and Coral started secretly seeing each other. Now, this is the interesting thing is, is he didn't very have to go very far to, to meet her because he was staying in, in Eaton Square um, and uh, where he had uh, lodgings with, with uh, Victoria and, and, um, and Mary. And Coral lived literally around the corner uh, at, at Eaton Place. So he would pop over there sometimes. And, uh, you know, yeah, it's, uh, unfortunately, by the time uh, Theatre of Love was finished filming and he returned back to the U.S., he then had to actually, like, um, him and Coral started really seeing each other um, more often because he was still over here in, 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 in London doing stuff, as we mentioned. And uh, in the end, he ended up, him and um, Mary had to actually uh, say goodbye to the marriage and they divorced. And then uh, Vincent and Coral were married in uh, late no 1974. So we move to the next film, number 11. Mm. So, yeah, so Vincent came back um, in 73 to film what was then called Revenge, The Revenge of Dr. Death. This was the film that he had uh, an a obligation to, f to finish with AIP. Uh, again, this was a good co-production with Amicus. And uh, this one could have been really good. Um, and I like it, but it could have been better um, because this is him basically playing a role that's fit for purpose. He plays a veteran horror actor who has been released from a sanatorium after the murder of his uh, fiance. And he finds himself being offered a job in Britain uh, doing a TV series based on his classic horror character, Dr. Death. And his old co-star um, is played by Peter Cushing, Herbert Flay, his character's name is, and he is the writer of this new series, and he's the one that really um, got the, the, the got the deal done uh, with uh, the head of uh, the company, the production company, which is actually Robert Quarry. So here we go, Robert Quarry's back, and uh, this one gave Vincent Price and Peter Cushing great quality screen time, um, and uh, it's uh, that's the, be the best thing of this film is the, the is the rapport that they have in their scenes but of course um, nothing is what it seems uh, when death starts stalking the tv studios and uh, the bodies start piling up vincent's character um is who's a bit 
slightly unstable, we wonder whether or not he's going to go insane again and crack under the pressure, which you have to see the film to find out what really happened. Now, you've, you've, you, you haven't actually said the name of the film. You said what it was supposed to be called, what it was originally going to be called, but you didn't actually call it what it's called. Oh, it's called that Mad is. House. Of course it is. So, yes. But you didn't, you called it Revenge of Dr. Death, and I was waiting for you to tell. Yeah, because I, I remember, thing. actually, when it came out in Australia at the drive-ins, it was Revenge of Dr. Death. Was it? Okay, yeah, was yeah. I've, just, I've got a clipping out of it. I've got, I cut it, I cut it out because I used to collect, I used to make us have a scrapbook of anything of, of horror films and still got them today. And uh, there it is. It says Revenge of Dr. Death. So, um, yeah. That's a cool thing. I've got yeah. my, my own, probably not as thick as yours, but it's. Uh, yeah. uh, but interesting to note is, is that when Vincent was filming that uh, in April of 73, it was tied in with the official release of Theatre of Blood in London. So uh, he, you know, he he was able to attend the big premiere, which was actually at Leicester Square, um, in um, in an April of um, in um, uh, in the twenty fourth of May, in seventy three. So okay, so there you go. That's uh, again 50, 50 years ago. Mm. Number twelve. Number twelve. Well, so Vincent uh, had. <laughs> I don't know why, but Vincent did one other film, which I'm not even going to like. I'm just going to briefly mention it. While he was in in London, uh, for some reason he just got uh, coerced into like doing the Peter Rogers uh, film Percy's Progress, mm. yeah. uh, the uh, seventy four sex comedy starring uh, what's his name? Uh, oh, I forgot his name now. Hyle Bennett. That's it. And uh, yeah, basically it's about Percy, who uh, is the it's the sequel to Percy, which is a much better film, which is a man with a large penis. And uh, he ends up finding out that uh, the whole male population of the world has become um, infertile, and he's the only person who can actually um, uh, repopulate the earth. Well, so wasn't they... there a transplant? Was it which? Is that the, which one's the transplant? Yeah, that, was was a... that was Percy. He had the transplant. Oh, okay. I had this the transplant. one, you know, he's, okay. he's still, you know, still got a large dong. And okay. this time around, it's like a basically a Miss Universe pageant where they get the most beautiful women around the world to actually bed in, and that's the story. Um, I mean. Uh, it's got some great funny bits in it. I mean, Barry Humphreys is just hilarious in it, and he pops up as Edna Everidge at one point, which is great. Um, and, uh, you know, there's lots of little cameos from everyone. Um, Marlo Shea's in there. Uh, just everybody's in there. Harry H. What, what, was Vin what was Vincent in there? What was he doing in this? Oh, film? Vincent plays a sort of like an uh, Aristotle Onassis type uh, ch character. He's the richest man in the world. And so he wants, he wants um, Percy for his own... Uh, personal gain to actually like you know um breed him some children so he's got heirs all right so it sounds, very, it's a very sounds, dull yeah sounds choice all right number 13 then number 13 well um number 13 we skip way 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 over to like so uh, vincent actually didn't do any films after 74 because he took a break to do something which was really probably more brilliant for him as a professional actor and that was he spent from 1977 to 1980 he was actually performing in his one-man show diversions and delights where he basically played oscar wilde giving a lecture in 1899 um, about his the trials and tribulations of his life um, the first act was like you know like the the, the, the ups and the second act was about the downs and it was just vincent um on stage by himself and he just absolutely brilliant in fact he said it was out of all of his performances that was his theatrical triumph and he ended up performing it like oh god over 800 cities in the states he went all the way like into canada and in the in, in the us and he also did a few shows that 45 shows in australia Mm. Um, and that's when I got to actually see him perform on stage uh, in in Perth. Um, and you met him though, didn't you? And I got to meet him afterwards. And so, yeah, I was, and it, that was because I was only only seventeen at the time. I hadn't really, I didn't know who Oscar Wilde was. So, um, uh, watching the thing, a lot of it went over my head. But afterwards, I actually went out and started like reading Oscar Wilde and then learning a little bit more about him. And in fact, because of that. I ended up starting to like read, you know, because I'd already started reading Poe and Nathaniel Hawthorne and any of the films that were actually based on literary people. I was actually reading them, and now I had to add Oscar Wilde, and uh, he was brilliant in that. So, so anyway, so watching Vincent Price is educational. It's yeah, educational watching Vincent Price. It is. It is an education. And then he was back uh, in um, 1980, back in London, 
uh, to shoot a film because he wanted to make a film which was like for kids, you know, a horror film for kids. He didn't really want to do horror anymore. But Milton Sabosky, who had actually done all of those fantastic amicus anthology films in the 60s and 70s, uh, he came up with this idea called The Monster Club. Uh, again, about uh, which would be uh, intertwining some um, tales by um, what's his name, uh, Chetwin Hayes. Yeah, um, uh, uh, Chetwin Hayes. Yes, uh, Ronald Chetwin Hayes. Yes. So it was his book, The Monster Club, and he basically used bits of that actual novel uh, with uh, with his own ideas, a couple of stories, and uh, it's um, it's a. I mean, I like it. Uh, everyone laughs about the the terrible makeup effects. The, I mean, the monster masks that they use for the, the actual club citizen, the club members are terrible. But Vincent is great, um, and he's just got this beautiful voice, especially, and he gives a, a, a really impassionate plea about why mankind is actually the biggest monster of them all. And I think that is just a, a, a great, uh, it's a great monologue at the end of the film. And uh, you've got some cool stories i mean uh i'd like the shadmok which is like this um, a creature who whistles people to like um death and uh, there's the ghouls at the in one of the sequences with this whole town of ghouls Remember them being the uh there's like a family tree and if certain monsters yes. breed they become a certain other monster including that one that whistles and all the kind of bizarre so. yeah so vincent for the first time on screen actually plays oh, on the big screen that is plays a vampire and uh, so where did he play the other one and it was probably not not early, not much earlier than that when well, you say um, a vampire oh he he, he, vamp well he played vampires on tv so yeah. well he was also in the muppets yeah yeah he got, he got bitten on the neck by kermit got, yes exactly so you know he's he's sort of like assumed that he was like a vampire in the muppets and he's also plays a vampire in f troop called okay. v for vampire but he's actually just an out, outsider who just likes to dress like vampire i like bell um but yes so but he plays a proper vampire here with retractable fangs and uh john carradine is playing uh the writer chapman hayes and he introduces him to the monster club and to that chart and explains to him how it all works um i thought it was all right I think that's pretty cool film. Unfortunately, like it. it didn't get it didn't get a it didn't get a theatrical release in the US. Um, okay. It actually went had a limited, very limited release here in the UK. But uh, basically, it was one of the first things that goes straight to video or VHS at that point. Yeah. So we've still got a couple more, a couple more of the British films he made. What's number Just fourteen? Two more. Just two more way to go. Two more. Okay. So after a seven-year hiatus. Um, Vincent returns to the horror genre in the only film that actually unites Vincent, Peter Cushing, and Christopher Lee, and John Carradine, um, all icons of horror, classic horror, and that's The House of the Long Shadows in 82. And I really, really like this film. I think it just works very well. Um, uh, it's got a great screenplay where basically it's a homage to the 1930s haunted house films, you know, like, you know, so, you know, there's, it's lots of like, you know, like uh, shadows and, and, and corridors and sort of creepy things happening. And, and uh, yeah, so it's, and it's got a really interesting story where um, this writer um, played by Desi Inez Jr. Uh, bets that he can actually write a um, a creepy horror novel in 24 hours. And so he goes up to Wales and stays in this old house, which he thinks is actually uh, vacant, and uh, discovers one by one that there's this strange family arriving, the Grisbanes, um, lauded up by John Carradine as the patriarch. And his sister is Sheila Keith, uh, I might mention that this film was directed by Pete Walker, who was best known for his really grisly exploitation horrors like Frightmare and House of Whipcord. They all starred Sheila Keith. And so she came in as uh, the, the female role. Originally, it was supposed to have been Elsa Lanchester, but she was a bit too ill at the time to come over from uh, to the UK to actually be that uh, to play that role and of course then you have the three brothers oh the two brothers sorry two brothers uh peter cushing and vincent price um as lionel and sebastian uh, grisbane 
and they've arrived as well. Vincent gets a fantastic, everyone has a great um, entrance, but Vincent gets the best entrance when the door opens and his shadow casts a long shadow on the back wall of the, of the, of the hallway when he goes, I have returned. And then Desi Arnaz starts to speak and he goes, don't interrupt me while I'm soliloquizing. <laughs> it's great. It's really, and this is really him actually going all out because he actually does, he's allowed to be a ham actor in this one, which is great. Um, but Peter Cushing is absolutely, oh, he's gets the most endearing performance. With He's got a little speech impediment with his character and he's very sort of, you know, frail. And he's just lovely. And of course, then who else arrives? But Christopher Lee, he's supposed to be playing the real estate um, agent who is looking after the house. But nothing's what it seems. And nothing is what it seems, which is the, the clever thing about the film, is what you're seeing is not really happening. <laughs> <laughs> it has some twists and turns. Uh, have you, you've seen this film, haven't you, David? Yeah, absolutely. I saw it because it was one of those ones you could get I don't know, quite, quite easily in Australia in the video shop, I remember. Yes, that's how yeah, I saw but, it first as well. Was, yeah, so some, of, yeah. some of these films I've not seen until my adult time. I Actually, probably more of them I actually did see of these lot because I think uh, it must have been that AIP was very easily accessible in Australia. Oh, well, actually, I can the, tell you the reason why that is is in 1970 is, is that AIP actually sold literally uh, a package of about 150 films to Australian network TV. Yeah, and, that's yeah, so exactly. and that's why we ended up getting the double bills that used to be on a Tuesday night. We used to get double bill AIP films uh, on a Friday, I think it was. But on a Tuesday night, we'd actually get a double bill Vincent Price AIP film. And that's how I saw, ended up seeing more. In Victoria, we got, it was when I, uh, when I was getting into all this, it was uh, ten forty-five on Channel Seven on a Sunday night. So I'd get, I'd ask Mum to be able to record them, and then I'd watch them on after school on Monday. So just saying, or go. sometimes, sometimes I'd watch them. But that's what, and each night would be a different one. So you know, each week, so you work your way through them all. So yeah. that was all fun. Okay, we're now up to fifteenth. Yes. Oh, so right. unlucky fifteenth, I think. I think <laughs> if, if you if you wanted to say a film which was Vincent's like sort of. British horror swan song, you wouldn't want to actually name this one. Uh, I know there's a lot of fans out there for it, but I just, I try watching it and it just fails dismally each time. And it's Bloodbath at the House of Death. Okay, so Kenny Everett, uh, you know, brilliant, brilliant Kenny Everett. I love Kenny Everett. And he is in his one and only basically big screen um, uh, film. And this was sort of like a, an attempt to do Friday the 13th meets The Exorcist in a slasher, Friday, yeah, you know, slasher environment sort of thing with aliens and Satanists, um, and paranormal investigators in the full works. And it was supposed to, be, it, had a, it has a lot of homages to different films. And if you watch it, it's quite, in one way, it's quite a lot of fun to try and pick the films that they're referring to. But... Mm. Uh, it just it's just a mess sort of thing and mm. Vincent crops up as the sinister man um, he's basically a Satanist who's been waiting hundreds of years for the great one to arrive but when he does somebody drops a candle and he burns alive <laughs> he also says the word dickhead as well I remember uh, piss off actually piss off was it piss yeah. off I knew it was something piss rude off. but you rude piss off that's right yeah okay that's it he's yeah so you know I mean, it's, got a, it's got a, a great British comedy cast, the cast, sort of Pamela Stevens is in there and Gareth Hunt and loads of people in there, yeah. but it just doesn't work for me, sort of thing, unfortunately, um, which is unfortunate because it's written by uh, one of my favourite comedians, it's Barry Cryer, sort of thing. So, um, oh, okay. I didn't know that. So, yeah, yeah. and it's, yeah, no, well, yeah. Vincent only did it as a favour because he was really good friends with the director, Ray Cameron. Okay. And of course, interestingly, is um, Ray Cameron, that's the. Uh, was known as that, uh, you know, Michael McIntyre, the comedian. Yeah. Uh, he ended up discovering years later that that was his real dad. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. I remember it was always in the, not the bargain bins, but it was always like, you know, there was always certain vid uh, VHSs you could get in, in Kmart, which is sort of like whatever you want to call it, like Asda or whatever in Australia. And it was uh, it was always there, Bloodbath, yeah. the House of Death. It was like yeah. three or four different videos was always there. It was always like the Body Snatcher, a couple of Val Lutons and Bloodbath, the House of Death. I don't know. I never bought it. 
and I'm not really that upset that I didn't now because yeah. it, looked a bit, it looked a bit funny, but a little bit rubbish. So we're going to leave it at that there because we've, we've spent an hour talking about these 15 films of uh, Vincent Price. Obviously, he was in lots of other TV shows. He was never off the telly. You know, I remember, you know, all through that period that he was uh, doing things. But besides, I'm going to put you on the spot here because you actually, you did a little bowl for us because you originally came on thinking that you were going to you were going to pick up and say, oh, name me a film. Now, I want you to pick me three of those, three of them, and I want you to tell me a, a fact about one of them that you haven't told us about. And I know there's some American films in there. I don't care. Just tell us. Give us, okay. a, give us a stunning fact about each of those three films, okay, then so we'll leave it. The first one is, oh, which find a general? <laughs> Okay, give me a fact that you didn't tell us before. Uh, Vincent really uh, catering. Vincent, of course, was a massive gourmet and, uh, you know, like he produced a number of cookbooks. And, uh, of course, that, that inspired me to write my cookbook, Supper with the Stars. But when he was doing Witchfinder General is that one day, because uh, the catering was not very good um, on location. And one day he actually, they were all staying in Bury St. Edmunds. And the film shoot was actually in Lavenham, it's quite a distance away. And so what he would do is, is in the evening uh, before the shoot, he would actually make up bowls of pasta um, or bowls of, you know, like uh, pasta salad that he would actually be able to help feed the crew um, during the day. And because uh, one day the, the, the catering truck didn't arrive and he actually ended up doing it himself. So that's one fact. One, okay. Next one. Uh, let's have a look. Oh, to Malaysia. Ah, okay. Vincent uh, became a hero during one, one sequence. The Shepparton Studios were uh, painted with uh, like with liquid cement. And uh, they at the end, there's obviously the climatic sequence where the set catch a well, the, where, the, where the tomb sets catch a light. And unfortunately, um, they caught a light a lot earlier than they expected it. And so therefore, uh, Vincent and Elizabeth Shepherd were actually, you know, like there. And uh, Vincent Ando actually helped carry Elizabeth Shepherd out, out to safety uh, as the fire, because the fire was catching out of control. There you go. All right, the last one. Last one. The Haunted Palace. Okay. Uh, Another okay, Poe so one. Sort of very easy. That is one of the, uh, the Poe Corman films. Uh, however, it's not really about Edgar Allan Poe. It was based on the case of Charles Dexter Ward, by H.P. Lovecraft, and it was the first time that a Lovecraft story had been um, adapted for film. Yep. There you go. So there you go. That was a, a very good film too. I saw that because it's my mum bought me all that on DVD and sent it to here in Britain, and I watched it, and it was very, very good. So uh, all these have been very good films. Uh, I think there's a couple there that you're probably not probably not watching a lot, but there's a lot of great films there for Halloween for who anyone wants to watch them. And especially uh, you might, given that uh, it is the 30th anniversary of Vincent's death, it would be probably a, a quite fitting thing to do this, this Halloween. Now, Peter, you've got a, I believe you've got a podcast that you've set up in recent times. Would you like <laughs> yeah. to tell us about that? Okay. So yeah, so my mate, Dave Reed and I, we often talk to each other about uh, films that we hadn't, that the other hadn't seen. And uh, it got, David came up with the idea and sort of saying, oh, why don't we challenge each other? Uh, you tell me a film that I haven't seen and I'll do the likewise and we'll watch it and then we'll just like, let's ramble on about it. So we've done, I think, three so far. So, um, yeah, so uh, they're, um, they're available. Uh, you can tune into them. Uh, What's it through. called? What's it it's called? It's called the podcast on... <laughs> okay, I'm going to put it in the in the just underneath here. You'll find it. You know, yeah. um, what's the what's the what's the name of the, oh the, pod, uh, the podcast on Nightmare Park? That's why, of course, it was oh, a homage to the uh, to the to the film uh, that um, uh, Frankie Howard did. Um, yes. and actually, and that, that's a that's a little bit of trivia. Is when Frankie was doing Nightmare, you know, like the Nightmare of um, Nightmare Park. Uh, it was at the same time as a Bonneville Doctor Five. So you got some great pictures of the two of them together. Behind the scenes. Yeah. All right, well, we're going to leave it at that. You have a great Halloween, Peter. I'll I, no doubt talk to you hopefully before then. But And before we go, yeah. for Halloween, everyone, if you are watching a Vincent Price film, the best thing to do is to get my book, Supper with the Stars, with, which features a lot of those films, and you can actually make a two-course meal out of it. 
They're very, very yummy, very yummy ones in there. I've got that book as well, so it's very delightful. Anyway, we shall see you later. Thank you very much for joining us. I've, I've been educated today, which is always important when we watch Spooky Owls. So you have a great day. And, Thank you very uh, much, David. See you later. Bye-bye. Happy Halloween, everyone.